can and uh, offer, giving them the best that you can of your offering. Excellent. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, so uh, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, here is a very brief agenda. We will uh, just use this as structure to get through uh, the session. So uh, firstly, we are just doing some welcomes and introductions. So welcome again. Uh, so, so we're going to start off uh, before we get into the detail, just in terms of uh, we're, we're talking today about these workforce reforms that have been proposed by the Labour government. Um, and I'm kind of interested to explore what's what's our role uh, as accountants and bookkeepers working for clients because fundamentally we're, we're accountants and bookkeepers we're not HR professionals so what's our role um, what is it that clients expect from us Lauren is going to talk us through uh, some of the detail around the proposal so just if you're uh, not aware yet or have, have heard bits and pieces uh, and haven't got the full picture as Lauren says we're going to try and condense hundreds of pages of guidance uh, into uh, 40 minutes for you um, assuming that we accept that we need to do something here that we have a role to play uh, supporting our accountant, uh, our clients uh, in our accounting and bookkeeping businesses. And um, how do we get access to the help uh, that we need? Um, and really, I've talked about this before, but what role exists for us to provide wider HR support to our clients? Um, we do that in Final Clark. We we kind of went through a journey of uh, 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 incremental steps in terms of how we did that. Um, so we'll touch a little bit on that and also how Safe HR are working with uh, uh, the profession to support uh, accountants and bookkeepers in this area. And I'm sure we're going to get loads of Q&A. Uh, so pop the Q&A in the Q&A box. I'll keep an eye on that. And and if there's particular technical things that, that you have questions on while we're going through, I'll direct those to, to Lauren. Uh, but we'll also have some time uh, at the end. But before we get into that, just in case anybody doesn't know, Sophia, do you want to just tell us a little bit about Safe HR, uh, who you are, your journey and how you work with accountants and bookkeepers? Absolutely. So Safe HR, it might sound like a new name to you. That's because we had a, a big rebrand this year. So we officially started out 10 years ago now, I think, maybe more, 11, um, as Citrus HR. Um, and we've always been here to support small, medium businesses who aren't necessarily large enough to have their own HR function, or they might not quite be at a point where they can hire their own person to do their in-house HR, and that's where we come in. So we offer HR advice, unlimited HR advice on a monthly rolling contract basis. We also offer HR software, so you can store all of your documentation in one place. You can do your holiday requests rather than having to look through emails or paper requests. You can do your appraisals on there. You can look at reports that to help you manage your staff and to help you manage your people in the system itself. We are here essentially um, to make small businesses' lives easier. Um, we rebranded this year to Safe HR, um, still with the same great offering, still with the same great team behind us. Um, we just, it was time to do something a little bit different. So we still work with a lot of accountancy firms, like I mentioned earlier, um, so that you can offer that support to your to your clients. Um, and we have a couple of different options actually for accountancy firms, which I will go into when we talk about how we can help your clients later on. Um, but I just, yeah, just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a background there about what we do. And the advice that we give kind of involves everyday um, HR queries. Um, it involves looking through any existing policies and documents you may have, any contracts, um, making any changes, making sure they're legally compliant. And if you don't have anything in place because you're just starting up or you just haven't got around to it yet, um, it's not a problem. Our team are there to, to give you everything that you need and make sure that you're fully functioning, legally compliant and up to date with all the employment law. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Sophia. And so we'll revisit that uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, we've we've worked with uh, with Safe and Citrus prior to that uh, for a number of years now, uh, and a lot of firms I work with, uh, I, I regularly suggest that uh, they they access the support that's available. And um, so let's get into the the detail uh, or almost the detail before we get uh, actually into the detail of the changes. Um, we're talking workforce reforms. Uh, everybody will have heard new Labour government have lots of plans for reforming worker rights that's what we're talking about today uh, but why is it important to us as accountants and bookkeepers and the way that I always view this is that um, most of us here are providing payroll services uh, for us at Final Clark our HR offering became an extension of what we did with payroll because we were well placed whenever a new client whenever a client 
took on a member of staff, it provides an opportunity for you to to ask if they've got employment contracts. Have they got employee handbooks? Have they got the fundamentals in place? Because as as I can't remember, it was Sophia or, or Lauren said right at the beginning, most small businesses and micro businesses um, with anywhere between one and five employees in many cases probably don't have access to any HR support um because it's one of those things that it comes at a cost and we think well we can get a we can get a contract offline and we we kind of muddle our way through um i i did that in in my firm so i'm sure that many of you are in similar similar situations so we don't have access to the support the professional support so my view here is that that there is an expectation um uh, we all like to think about ourselves being proactive um we should be having conversations with clients about anything that's likely to affect them uh, in the way that they run their business. And and this is clearly no exception. Um, if you're running payroll, uh, we're going to talk a bit about minimum wage and national living wage. Those changes clearly have a direct impact. Uh, so how do clients start to plan for that? So I think as a base minimum, we have an obligation to at least make sure that we're sharing communications with our clients about these changes and what's going on. We're going to make that really easy for you because everybody that's registered, safe, have kindly put together a one pager that highlight the main reforms. Um, so we're going to share that with everybody post webinar. Um, so at the very least, you have an opportunity to send something to your clients to say, hey, did you know about these changes that are coming? From there, it's your choice in terms of how far you go with this. And hopefully at the end of this session, you'll have a clearer idea of, of how far you might want to go yourself. But equally, what support uh, is is available. So we're going to touch on that a bit more in a while. But I just thought it was really important to to kind of just line up what, what I think our, our role is as accountants and bookkeepers when we think about this stuff. So getting into uh, the detail um lauren i'm gonna i'm gonna hand over to you at, at this point to at least at least set the scene and, and start working through uh these these areas i'll leave this slide on while we talk through this section of the session uh and then we'll drop it off shortly um and uh and, and pick up the conversation but lauren over to you lovely um like i said if you do want to uh chip in or, or, or give thoughts as we go through um to avoid me in a monologue for for however long uh, then do feel free to um so obviously um i said at the beginning there's there's 158 pages in these proposed reforms 28 reforms in total and um, we've picked out the sort of the key the key areas of importance um understandably a lot of of, of businesses are, are concerned and quite unsettled um, by the, the the breadth and the and the depth of these proposed changes in terms of the, the preparation work, uh, the potential financial and mm. time implications. Mm. Um, the reality is uh, the vast majority of these changes aren't going to come into effect um, all in one go. Uh, we're looking at uh, while we don't have sort of defined time scales. Um, over the next couple of years um so potentially some in october next year um a, a few potentially earlier um but but some of the may ones um so i'm going to talk quite a bit around the day one employment rights we're not realistically expecting until um april 26 what that means though is there's still a lot of preparation work um, that we can be doing one as employers um but also in terms of a, a advising and and adding that value to clients um so and Lauren, just, into... so, just just on on that i mean and and i think if this is why this is so topical now isn't it because if you if you look at the the the, the kind of day one employment rights uh if if they come in 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 april 26 that's less than two years away so uh any any kind of uh decisions we're making about hiring now potentially those hires are, are, are going to be impacted by this change because it may well come in before they get to the end of their two-year term. Absolutely. Um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll go into that shortly. Um, I think there's sort of the pressing one, and I, I think I heard that somebody already had a question around the uh, the TIPS Act. Um, so the new TIPS Act um, actually came into place. Um, it, it, it was put forward by the Conservative government before um, before obviously Labour came in. Um, and that's been implemented and effective from the first of this month. So uh, companies, uh, obviously, particularly in hospitality, 
um, hair and beauty, um, takeaways, etc., uh, will need to be implementing this right now. Um, so basically, to sort of summarise the act, um, it in in its essence, workers, including agency workers. Um, are now entitled to 100% uh, of tips, gratuities, service charges um, that are received. Um, in terms of how that's paid, uh, it's 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 obviously subject to tax and NI, needs to be paid within a month of the tip or gratuity being received. Um, companies are re required to have a policy in place where there is uh, tipping um, and staff also have a, a right to request a log of that. So there's obviously there's admin implications in terms of record keeping uh, for that, which um, off the top of my head, it's three years that that needs to be retained for. Um, so big changes, uh, obviously affecting a particular sector that are already um, implemented. Um, kind of tying into that, uh, we've got um, again, we don't know for definite the time frames of, of this. The um, um, low pay commission are currently reviewing um, national living wage. So at the, as it stands at the moment, there are, there's, I'm pretty sure everybody will know, there are differentials um, in minimum wage for 18 to 20 year olds, 21 and above, etc. Um, the Labour government has indicated that they want to reduce that and potentially remove um, that 18 to 20 band. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of nervousness around this. There's a lot of uh, huge implications from granular level at, at small businesses all the, all the way through. Um, having read around what the LPC is saying uh, in their consultation, I think at a minimum, we're looking at around about a 10% increase um, in that 18 to 20 bracket, which will have obviously significant um, financial implications uh, mm. for for small businesses. And it has a knock-on impact as well, doesn't it? So any changes to, to to minimum wage has a knock-on effect through the pay scales, doesn't it? Because if somebody says, well, hang on a second, somebody down here is, uh, is, is now paid this and, and I'm skilled and I've got experience, so therefore my uplift should be should be far greater. Um, yeah. So it, it's not just about affecting that that bottom bottom end, uh, are we, in terms of uh, uh, the impact of national living wage, national minimum wage, whatever whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's it, you, you're right. Well, it's it's the roll on impact. Then how that then goes sort of up the chain, if you like. Um, whilst it's not into a legislation reform. Um, within this there's there's a view in terms of next steps to to really look into <clears throat> fair pay um one within certain sectors so social care um uh, but also um looking at sort of more standardization of um uh, salary benchmarking and, and yeah essentially f fair pay um it's quite sketchy the detail around that at the moment but we can see this is kind of the the starting point for that yeah, uh, and and as as I expected, question here from from Jen on exemptions around the tips. Uh, so Jen says we work at a golf club which has different types of staff gratuities. It's paid under a trunk scheme, uh, which means it's NIC exempt. We've paid annually previously. The question is if the staff agree to adopt annual payment of gratuities, is this lawful? Um, uh, or is the new legislation, and and if uh, we we need to get an answer and go back to Jen, uh, we know Jen, so we can do that. But um, uh, in terms of your understanding of the guidance, of, based on what you've done so far, because uh, yeah. you said the payment's got to be made within thirty days, um, are there exceptions to that that you're aware of? Um, not that I'm aware of, Jen. I'll I'll have a look into that um, and and come back to you directly if that's okay. My understanding is that it's 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 a monthly. Um, payment well, yeah. has to be within a month of that particular tip or gratuity being paid. Leave that with us, Jen. I'll we'll, come back uh, to you, Jen. We'll come back to you on that. Um, sorry, uh, Lauren, <laughs> uh, carry on. Uh, it, it was inevitable. There was always going to be curveball questions to these. <laughs> <laughs> um, lovely. Okay, so day one employment rights. Um, I mean, th this is really the core of the bill. Um, the the main area that, that people are talking about looking at. Um, so essentially the proposal for this is that 
basic employment rights will kick in for, for, from day one for everybody. Um, so currently there are um, exceptions to this. So uh, bereavement leave is an example, uh, paternity leave um, and paternal leave. Um, they're actually relatively quick wins and a lot of, of companies already um, go above and beyond, um, particularly sort of in terms of, of paternal leave. Um, the main one around this, uh, which I think everybody will probably have, have heard of, is the day one right to claim unfair dismissal. So as it stands, and, and this clause is, has been in law since the early 70s, um, it's changed uh, throughout that from between six months and, 12, and 24 months for what's called the qualifying period. So this is essentially after currently two years, um, employees have a, get their full employment rights. So they have the, the right to claim unfair dismissal from an employer if they're um, dismissed for essentially what is deemed an unfair re uh, reason. And there's a number of criteria be behind that. So the removal or the proposed removal um, of this qualifying period um, and introducing the, the day one employment right does or will have uh, quite serious knock-on impact uh, for businesses. So we'll need to be thinking around recruitment, um, around probation, uh, around the induction process. It won't be a case of six months in, it's not working out and a, a very easy out the door, which which obviously gives employers flexibility at the moment. Um, what will be interesting and with a lot of these proposed changes, the devil's in the detail, um, which is a horrible management phrase that I've picked up over the years and, and seem to, it always seems to rear its head. Um, so the, the proposal is for a nine month, well, looking like a nine month probation period. Um, what will be interesting is how that proposal for a probation period will differ to what is currently the qualifying period. Um, it's it's seen at the moment as a concession to employers to give some of that flexibility to say, you know, it's it's not working. Here's here's a week's notice, and it you know it, it gives that flex. Um, but really, from now we we need to be thinking about um, upskilling managers in terms of recruitment. You know, is is a simple interview enough? Do we need to really test and make sure that we we are getting rather than sort of taking a chance? The, the right person for the right role mm. and and the 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 issue with with obviously the changes here is that the probation period gives you the ability almost to to say it's not working but that's largely performance driven isn't it um mm -hmm. uh, so what happens if somebody loses a large contract and and actually they they just don't need the person they took on currently it's dead easy to just say, sorry, we've lost this contract. We we haven't got the work for you anymore um, within that whole two year period. But my interpretation of, of this is that if it's not performance and it's a situation like that, you've almost got to go through a redundancy process to be able to exit that person from, from the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd be looking at that. So as it stands the, the there's there's no proposed changes on the redundancy process itself other than the the potential ban yeah. on hiring uh, fire and rehire uh, yeah. which has always been a rather controversial uh, method of restructuring uh, anyway yes. yeah so again if we're thinking about what the actions are and the things that we need to be helping clients understand is that uh, you you can't now take a risk on recruitment whereas before we might have said well we think this is going to happen so let's get the bodies in let's get the people into the business to enable us to to meet that demand those kind of decisions are going to have to be much more carefully considered um uh in the event that this legislation comes comes into effect because we lose the flexibility to be able to say well we can take a risk on it on the basis that if it doesn't work out we've we've got an easy out in terms of uh, um going back to the resource levels that we were before um so all of these things are are considerations that that were much easier for us um uh, as it stands now than it might be in two years time yeah and it, i mean it's interesting because 
a, a lot of the implications for this are, are best practice are the kind of things that myself um safe hr would be advising on so you know you, you, you take somebody on you have a, a, a clear development plan um and document probation meetings this this is just taking it a step further um to to protect employees um yeah. but also ultimately you know it, it creates a, a a good working environment so the, the theory and the the reasoning behind these reforms really is about how do we engage um engage and motivate a workforce to increase productivity to increase gdp etc yeah. um so it's it's coming back to you know we can look at the legislation in black and white maybe it's not enough however it's how that's then applied and taking some of that best practice um, sure. that the legislation enforces yeah so zero hour contracts another one that um uh, obviously we're hearing lots about yeah, history unless employees want them. There may be a clause with this. Um, so the zero hours contracts, again, they've they've been a little bit controversial um, in terms of their application. Um, they're viewed as exploitative, which is, is quite a strong word. Um, there was a bill, um, uh, the Workers' Predictable Terms and Conditions um, Act of 2023, which was due to come in this year. This supersedes that, so that act isn't coming in. Um, the, the, sort of the principle behind this is that there, anybody with flex, well, uh, variable hours um, at least has some predictability with it. Um, like I say, there is that caveat um, around unless employees want it. Um, and the, a lot of research on people in the gig economy uh, employees workers do um this it is quite a popular um employment method for those for that that those that particular <laughs> group <laughs> um the the other um sort of key thing here um is around giving reasonable notice if you know the the reality is um a, a lot of companies who who work with zero hours contracts there may not always be that predictability, so shifts might get cancelled. Um, there's there's a tightening in terms of reasonable notice and reasonable compensation for that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, of implications, right now, um, companies that, that do work with zero hours contracts, there really needs to be some workforce planning in that um, in terms of looking at shifts, um, how that can be um managed and Sophia I'm sure will be able to talk around how, how safe HR the uh, the software can help with that um and 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 just looking at actually do we need a zero hours contract is it a true zero hours contract actually is it a set number of hours that it it almost is the switch of the, the next topic which is around flexible working it actually creates more rigidity uh, mm. for employers um, flexible working uh, default. So um, earlier this year, the new legislation around flexible working was implemented, the, implement, uh, the 2023 Act. Um, essentially, um, the, the sort of the key word on this is default, where it's seen that flexible working uh, will be the, the standard. Um, this basically just takes the current act a little bit further. Um, I'm reading about it. It, it, it reminded me when uh, Opal Fruits became Starburst. It's essentially the same act, but just in slightly different packaging. Um, a, a number of, of clients that I've worked with have struggled with, with implementing the act so far, um, where again it kind of it goes against where you've got shifts you, you can only accommodate so much flexibility um so there are certain industries that will be more impacted by this yeah because because i think in in simple terms isn't it the case is now that that anybody can request flexible working and yeah. and it's down the responsibility sits with the employer uh to justify why it's not 
allowable. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and that we expect that there will be <clears throat> clearer regulations on what is allowable um, or, or or deemed as reasonable. It's just essentially a, a slight tightening of the regulations. Um, yeah. I, I suppose the key thing, and again, this is already implemented, um, but it, it is a day one right, uh, whereas previously it was it was a six month or twenty six yeah. week. Uh, and a quick question that's come in on the uh, on on the kind of day one employment rights. Uh, would would you be able to do short term contracts with a view to leading to permanent employment if the employee performed well, circumstances allow? So are we are we going to see a shift towards fixed term contracts uh, rather than permanent contracts? That is a hot discussion at the moment in the in the HR forums that I'm involved in. Um, the the, the cryptic answer is we just don't know at the moment um and this is where the the sort of the specifics around probation periods and what that means um is is really key i think as the the discussions and the consultation and this is why we don't think it will be um implemented until 2026 it it, it is complex because we've got to balance out you know if 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 we've got job seekers or people looking to to move roles um and that kind of approach is implemented there's a degree of uncertainty we know particularly with with generation z like the, there's companies that are actually removing probation periods um mm. because of of that mindset and that uncertainty and yeah. um, so there's there's the social demands to take into account um against loopholes um and, and ways around um but it will be it will be interesting to see how that uh that conversation that debate continues yeah yeah excellent conscious of time so we probably need to whip through these uh these these last few uh uh points here lauren so uh, <laughs> uh I'll, I'll leave you and, and and it was always going to be a challenge wasn't it 150 it, it was i'm afraid it's it is slightly top loaded in terms of the content you're <laughs> glad to know uh, ban on fire and rehire, I've touched on already. Um, essentially, this is this process is going to be removed. It basically means during a consultation, um, the, uh, organisations have the ability to essentially rehire um, existing staff on less favourable financial terms. You can see why it's controversial. Um, sexual harassment, um, this is being implemented on October 26th. Um, so basically, um, companies need to have greater protections for their employees, both from clients um, and third parties, um, and obviously also internally. Um, so it's 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 taking what currently is the case and going above and beyond in terms of policies. Mm. Um, fair work agency. Um, this agency is planned to be introduced again we don't know the time frames for this um but in terms of regulating compliance and making sure that companies small medium large are um compliant um this will be in place um the the key thing that will evolve from this is knowing um fines penalties etc mm -hmm. that may be put in place um and carried out uh, by the by the fair work agency yeah. um oh sorry go on will uh it's gonna say before we go to right switch off we jumped enhanced ssp so uh if we, oh, can we did i apologize um so <laughs> this is actually quite a big one and um, so enhanced ssp um two key things with this at the moment um there is a lower earnings threshold which is 123 pounds a week um for anybody to be entitled to ssp um and ssp doesn't kick in until day four um of, of of an employee being sick um the plan is for um one the removal of the lower earnings threshold um and two for ssp to kick in from day one which obviously has financial implications will and i have, have had chats around um you know it, is this potentially going to open the floodgate uh, for for people to are we going to see increased levels of sickness 
Hmm. Um, there is a chance that this could be implemented sooner rather than later. Um, it could be as early as April 2025. Um, I think um, one of the key things uh, that I wanted to say around this, which has completely gone out of my head. Um, <laughs> Normally away. One of the sort of the reasons behind this, um, so currently the, the way that SSP works and how it impacts across the country, um, there's an estimated 1.15 million people, workers, who currently under the existing rules don't aren't eligible for SSP and almost 70% of them are women. Um, so it, this is really tackling an inequality um, agenda, which again is referred to in the reform mm -hmm. as a, a next steps um to, yeah. to really look at various cool. aspects of inequality cool and the last one's probably ultra controversial as well isn't it it is and we were all expecting this to be one of the main elements of the uh of, of the reform documents and it's actually it's, it's kind of slipped under the radar more so this is right to switch off um which is essentially um but the, in a nutshell, um, for em employers not to contact um, their employees or workers outside of their core work hours, um, unless from exception. Um, we were, were expecting that to be um, positioned as being legislated. It's looking like that's going to be put forward as a code of practice um, and, and, and best practice guidance, as opposed to actually legislated, which, which has been quite a surprise uh, for a number of a number of professionals mm -hmm. okay good Ooh. um sophia um uh we've, we've left you there patiently in in the background um obviously safe hr have pulled together a, a fair chunk of uh of guidance around this and as i said we've got that one pager to go out um anything particular that that you've heard from from lauren there that that you're hearing talked about um by your legal team and and everything else that we we need to draw any extra attention to? I think obviously sexual harassment is the front of people's minds because it's coming into effect mm. very soon. Um, so I think that just to make sure that you're really, even if, I think basically just make sure that you know what's going on there really. I think even if it's just more sort of the high level stuff, um, but if you've got, your clients have got any questions or they're worried about making sure that things are in place in time, um, that's kind of where we can come in and we can support them with that. Really no problem at all. Um, okay. And at, like our team are very much up to date with everything that's going on. So again, if your clients have got any concerns that they're not going to be able to ensure that they've got everything in place or they're not exactly sure what they need to do, um, that's, that's where we come in as well. And our team will be able to support them with everything. Yeah. And and I'm particularly interested just in terms of listening through through back through everything that Lauren Lauren said, um, with the TIPS Act. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm not involved in a, on a day to day basis with clients and things at the moment, but but that one had passed me by completely, uh, in terms of this is now legislation. Um and and as you rightly say, the systemization of of managing that process has got to be absolutely horrendous um, so, so if if you have clients in hospitality or or hairdressing beauty um uh but the taxis i i mean there's there's tons isn't there um uh, i would certainly be suggesting that you you have a conversation with them in terms of are they aware uh of of the new the new legislation and, and what are they doing to tackle it because it does sound like that could be a bit of a minefield. Are there other penalties already in place? Is there a penalty regime already in place for that, Lauren? I would expect so. What it yeah. is, I'm not hundred percent sure. Okay, fine. It, it it's just what's the what's what's going to drive people to to do it and and who who is picking up on it. Uh, I, I I guess it's a case of uh, the the employees may well have heard about it and are going to their employers and saying, hang on a second, if if it's not happened, maybe I'm uh, uh, under underestimating that that sector and they've they've done the work. Um, but it certainly slipped me by. So interested to hear if it slipped anybody else by. Um, 
Cool. So uh, thank you for for kind of going through that detail and 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 successfully kind of narrowing 150 odd pages down into uh, uh, the time that you you spent on that. Just for the moment, I'm going to stop the stop the screen share um, as we kind of just go through some of the, the the kind of the broader things around this. We now know what the issues are that that uh, we have to contend with. Um, Sophia, in terms of you're working with lots of accountants, that's your main area of, of activity. Um, what are you seeing and hearing from those firms in terms of client expectations? What, what are clients' expectations of their payroll bureaus, for example, to go beyond just kind of dealing with, with making sure that pay slips get sent? So a lot of the accountants that, are, that we already have at Partners are finding that their clients are expecting a lot more from them now than just to be able to run their payroll each month. They're finding they're getting a lot of questions. And initially, accountants would then have to say, I'm really sorry, but this isn't within our remit. You're going to have to go elsewhere, which is fine. But it's also not really ideal because your clients trust you implicitly because you're doing a massive part of running, helping them with a massive part of running their business, running their payroll. So if you can either give them a tell them somewhere to go that you know they're going to get a good service, good support and good um, advice. Brilliant. And if you want to take it a step further, you can also add it to your own offering. So what we do a couple of things with accountants. One of the options that we do is um, we have accountants just simply refer their clients to us. It's really like touch. Um, mm -hmm. our clients, their clients come to us we set them up as customers um, and we invoice them each month and that's that. It's just a referral and you can either pass on a discount to your client just so that, say, thanks for coming to us, but uh, here you go, have a 10% have a discount or you can earn commission if that's the way that you want to go as well. So any of your referrals that come to us that sign up, you can earn commission on that as well. So that's a little bit of an extra revenue stream for your business. Um, alternatively, what you can do if you really want to take it that next step and say, you know what, I really want to add this extra string to my bow and this extra offering to my business, is you can actually white label the software in your branding. We're very clear that we're working together um, and we will still be providing your clients with all of the technical support for the system, all of the HR support and advice as well. But we will be you will be able to add that as part of your package. So you'll be able to charge your clients as you please. Um, and you'll have the kind of that extra string to your bow when it comes to HR. Yeah, and and obviously there's, there's two sides to this, isn't there? We've we've got accounting firms that are employing people, um, mm -hmm. and then we have our clients, uh, and and you you work closely on the first of those as well, don't you? In terms of providing a solution for firms to get access to the software for themselves. Absolutely yes. So um, the great thing about becoming a partner is not only are you offering that extra added value to your clients you're also able to access the software and the advice for yourself so as a partner you can actually have use the software completely for free um so you don't need to pay for it at all you can manage all of your hr admin through the software completely for free and in you can also get a 25 percent discount on your monthly service fees if you want to use our hr full service um so it's a really good offering that we do give partners because we know that you're very much value to us and we know how much your clients value you yeah uh so um in uh, we've kind of rolled into the the next topic there as well in terms of uh where do we get where do we get the help um and uh sophia's covered off what what safe hr do um uh in in terms of what we did in in final clark we've worked with citrus for, for a long time um but we also started to to kind of support our clients with with hr um initially using a uh a, a, a subcontractor that that white labeled um as as our hr service um we had clients that that were keen to use that service and and we progressed to the point of uh recruiting recruiting lauren um uh who splits her role between clients facing work and and internal work uh for me there's just a really clear synergy um between what we're doing uh as as a payroll bureau extending into providing clients that broader broader hr support um and the opportunity that that safe hr offer is that that you can you can get access to that support to be able to to help your clients with with their with their HR HR offering and and Lauren just in terms of some of the stuff we're doing with clients I mean how how's that working how's that being received? Um, so we're at the moment with obviously the the, the recent 
uh, changes that have been being proposed. Um, we're, we're taking a proactive approach, working with the clients that we've got, um, working with our payroll team um, to to try and get on the front foot. Which I think, you know, the 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 key message that I would say is f- from all this is to be ahead of the curve, um, regardless of role. Um, you know, as as accountants, there's there's that element of added value there. You know, having having that broader understanding of the the significant financial and, and time impact that this is going to have on clients, being able to have those discussions, see where the pinch points are, um, you know, advise or at least be able to advise who to advise, um, in terms of of workforce planning, for example, thinking about zero hours contracts and and contractual changes that are going to going to come. Um, you know, it's it's that talking point. It's it's that add on. So a uh, part of my role is also talking um, with our accountants and and giving them that that sort of that broader awareness of of what is going on in the, in the world of workforce reforms. Yeah, cool. And um, and I always like to uh, to kind of finish these these sessions off with with highlighting kind of the the, the key takeaways. Uh, and we've still got time for Q and A, by the way. So if anybody's got any questions on on any of the uh, the details we've shared or anything in terms of of how Safe HR can support you and your clients, um, pop them in the Q and A box, and we'll tackle those. Um, but Lauren, you used the term a moment ago, be ahead of the curve. Um, uh, and, and we touched during a session on, on things like anybody that you recruit now, uh, is, is likely to be caught by the, the changes to the two year, uh, qualifying period. Um, uh, if it happens in April 26, because that's less than two years away. Um, so, uh, the, the, in terms of, of, from an HR point of view directly, um, uh, do you want to just talk us through these, these key kind of points that you've got here? Yeah, sure. I mean, this this applies um, for for practices uh, to look internally as as much as in terms of bearing in mind um, on advising, discussing, and and signposting clients to to companies such as Safe HR. Um, so you know, the key thing is is compliance with this. So identifying at an early point which policies are likely to be affected. So flexible working policies. Uh, bereavement policies, um, some of some of the more simple ones. There will be contractual implications. Um, one in terms of are we compliant now? Two in terms of okay, what are these changes going to to impact? Uh, so disciplinary policies, for an example. Um, recruitment practices. Um, I talked a lot around this with the um, the day one uh, rights. Um, you know, are recruitment practices as good as they could be is onboarding um right looking at retention rates etc um training managers you, your managers um or, or your clients managers are going to be really key to implementing um this so educating rather than all in one go in sort of bite-sized chunks this is what you need to know um sexual harassment policy um and processes uh, th- that's a pressing one uh, 26th of october um, and obviously, um, it's not on here, but we, we've we've touched on the um, the Tips Act, um, which was implemented at the start of this month. So, I, I mean that that's a a key initial discussion point with with clients in that area. Um, and then the 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 final thing, and it, it kind of ties it all together, is is around the emphasis on workforce planning. Obviously, there's there's a financial um, implication on this, um, but. There's also, you know, considering the, the potential reforms on zero hours contracts, um, again, the, the day one working rights, which is so core cool, um, to these reforms. Um, and, and what I would suggest to everybody, and it's 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 not necessarily your professional, your arena, but signing up to, to somewhere where you get regular updates on how this these reforms progress, um, I'd, I'd strongly advise so that you're, on the front foot to be able to have those those real value adding conversations with clients 
Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Lauren. And and obviously the other key one here is is uh, you have the opportunity to get a, a free uh, version of of Safe HR for your practice. Um, I would strongly urge that that you that you do that. Um, we will be sending out uh, a copy of the recording. Um, uh, and, and apologies, uh, it wasn't set to auto record, so uh, some of the introductions were clipped off the beginning of that. So my apologies, but you will get the uh, uh, the main uh, the main body of the session uh, together with that one page document that safe hr have kindly put together for you to share with your clients um there'll also be uh details in there in terms of how you can sign up for your your free account for safe hr um to at least start to give you access to some of this stuff for your for yourself and there's lots of software that's going to be really useful um uh sophia lauren uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you what's the best way to do that please i know sophia you popped something in the chat box just a moment ago um but how should people reach out and and get in touch with you Yes, yeah, so I've just put my email address in the chat. That's probably the easiest way to, to get in contact. Um, otherwise, you can always find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, I've, yeah, they're the best two ways to find me. Excellent. And Lauren? I have just done exactly the same. I've added my uh, email details um, and I'm, I'm also on LinkedIn. So, so feel free to get in touch. Excellent. Lovely. Um, so uh, we're, we're not far off the quarter past, as I said, but I did say if anybody had any questions, um, we would uh, happily continue to take those uh, uh, for those people that have got uh, questions that you'd like answered. Um, uh, so Melanie has raised a hand. Melanie, if you can pop a, uh, a question, if, if that was intentional uh, to raise your hand, if you can pop a, uh, a question in the chat box or Q&A box for us, we'll, uh, we'll tackle that. Um, uh, and whilst that happens, if anybody else has anything else, uh, do pop it in the, uh, in the box. We'll give 30 seconds or so uh, on that, just to see if anything comes in. And whilst we do that, um, uh, I shall say a huge thank you to everybody for taking the time to join us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your diary um this is a big topic uh there's no doubt about it and and so we couldn't get into the the true detail um uh but both Lauren and Sophia uh, are always happy to to help with anything that we uh we haven't answered for you um uh big thanks to to, to Lauren uh particularly for for doing most of the hard work uh today and thank you to Sophia uh, and the team at uh, Safe HR uh, for helping uh, this month as our app of the month. Uh, quick question for you, Sophia. Is there a minimum number of clients we need to refer to Safe HR to be classed as a partner? The answer to that is no, isn't it? But I'll let you confirm that. Yeah, the answer is no. There's no minimum. Um, the only thing that we do say is we like to have at least one person within a year um, to be referred to us for you to keep up that, uh, that free use of the software. But otherwise, no, there's no minimum that you have to refer just to be classed as a partner excellent thank you for the question alexis um cool uh, i think uh that looks as though that's all of the questions uh and uh uh, uh so on on that basis again huge thank you to both of you uh and to the safe hr team for help putting together that one pager that we'll share uh thank you to everybody for attending hope the session's been useful um uh do do talk to your clients i mean all i would say here is be proactive uh use the one pager we're going to get to at least start the conversation um just to make sure that the that, that clients know what What's, what's around the corner uh thank you both very much uh, do join us next month for our next app of the month uh and and thanks again to safe hr for for working with us app of the month this this month uh have a great rest of the day everybody uh thank you both again uh lauren and sophia and we will see everybody soon thanks everyone thanks. take care bye-bye